Hello and welcome to the biggest week of talk of the town yet. The grand final is outside of Melbourne for the first time in history to the Port Adelaide Premiership champion, Warren Treadray. How many grand finals would you have won if they didn't have to beat the MCG? Oh, <laughs> probably another one. <laughs> it, probably, it probably makes the difference of 120 points because then we would have won by <laughs> point. But I don't give a stuff. South Australia comes second. I always like silver better than gold. And I'm on. Yeah. What Bring it that? on. Oh, that's the maroon scarf for the Queenslanders. That's Queensland, yeah. Not the Lions, but the Queenslanders. Right. The, uh, the Cane Toads. Wife. Sam McClure yep. has been breaking a lot of stories about the grand final and the deal that was done beforehand. He is the Chief Footy Reporter for the Nine Network. Hi, Sammy. Hello, Seb. And Warren, I've got to say, I think you've lowered your colours settling for second. Surely you would have seen Talladega Nights and listened to the great Ricky Bobby. If you ain't first, you're last. Yeah, that's true. But if you're outside and you're enjoying the sunshine, like all of us in Queensland uh -huh. and South Australia and Western Australia, no, we'd stay quiet. No, but you know what? That is a <laughs> no, no, I will ask this question right now. Do you regret not going to a Queensland hub earlier? Well, uh, unlike you, Warren, I have several responsibilities here in Victoria and it just so happens that it is difficult for me to fulfil those requirements uh, in Queensland. So it's for the betterment of the people that I've remained in my home state. Yep. <laughs> I heard it was McClure or Jake Nile and they went with Nile at the age. But anyway, <laughs> um, we, uh, Nothing uh, like a silver medal. What did, what did Ricky Bobby <laughs> say again? <laughs> um, let, now let's have a look at this first. This is the beautiful vista that Gil McLaughlin delivered his press conference in front of. It was postcard perfect. And if I may say so, Gil had a fantastic sense of theatre doing this. We knew where the game was going, and yet he did this one Antonio Samarant-style build-up where he awarded the game to Queensland. Sam, well, we'll start with you. Tell us what you thought of it, and also just tell us what has gone on behind the scenes to help the Victorian government give up a game they had a contract for for the next 34 years. Yeah, they certainly, you know, they didn't want to, Seb, as you can imagine. They did it begrudgingly in the end. And even Martin Pakula early in the week, the sports minister, actually said on the record that, you know, if we could make the decision on October 23, then it's a good chance that the grand final would be here because we'd have a better understanding of the numbers. But, I mean, obviously they had to make a decision now. Look, I personally think it's great for the game. I, thought, I think the Adelaide Oval would have done a spectacular job. I think it would have been great in WA as well two very famous, rich football states. But the growth in Queensland is exponential, Seb, at the moment. Um, and given what, um, you know, the Premier has done and the state has done to keep the game going, they deserved it, didn't they? I think it's going to be great at the Gabba. I think there's going to be more money, um, more footy knowledge pumped into that great state. Um, it can only be good for the nationalisation of the game, in my opinion. Trent, I've got to ask this. OK, there is a contract that will remain in place that will return the game to the grand final supposedly for another three decades. But do you think this decision, forced upon by COVID, just weakens the idea that the grand final is a Melbourne exclusive event and we might see the debate ramp up that would see the AFL take into market? Well, I'd love to say, yeah, but the facts are there's a contract and the AFL did a contract that suits their own agenda better than the rest of their clubs. And what I say is, yes, it helps the finances of the game, but it was never in the best interest of South Australia, never in the best interest of the you know, Sydney clubs, the, you know, the New South Wales clubs, the Brisbane clubs and uh, in Queensland and also Western Australia. So I did find it a little bit amusing yesterday. People are talking like it's the game has died and all that. And I get Victoria's going through hell and back. Don't worry about that. But the game we should be celebrating is it's going on. It is going to different parts. And at a time, if you want to make a mark, and that's why I'm not, you know, I'd love for it to be at Adelaide Oval. I'd love to drive 20 minutes from my house into the grand final and go, how good is this? But the reality is it's not. It's in Queensland. But when you're sitting there and looking at Gold Coast um, Titans, you sit back and go the Broncos and the Cowboys. Where are they? They're in the bottom four or so on the ladder in the NRL. What better time to make an imprint on young kids in Queensland than yeah. right now? And I think they've done a wonderful job. Yeah. Just before we move on from the grand final, uh, just a uh, one-sentence answer, Dredders. Powder finger for the halftime or pre-game entertainment? Should be already done. Done. Yeah, I'm with that. We might return to the music later. Sammy, uh, the golf course that Gil was on, do you know which golf course it was? I could see a few people playing in the background. Yeah, that's Palm Meadows, Seb. Uh, it's in great condition, isn't it? Uh, although everything's beautiful up in Queensland. So the locals 
tell us. We're about to find out in the next few weeks. But the, the, just have a look at this vision, if you can. I, I couldn't. I actually couldn't contain myself on the couch. I had to. I had to sit on the floor. I was laughing so hard. Maybe it's just the inner golfer in me that's hit so many thousands of balls into the water. Have a look at the gentleman just on Gil McLaughlin's right hand side behind him. Whatever fairway that is, we'll call it the 16th. Has obviously just rank hooked one into the drink. <laughs> he got up and had a look, and the hands on hips of. Hey, I wonder. I wonder where this could be. I just, I reckon, Darren, Darren, didn't you see the goal? It's in the lake, mate. It's in the lake. It's <laughs> and you're on national TV, you spud. <laughs> you know what was better about it, boys? When I watched it and I got your message not so long ago, um, Seven Sam, it was like, oh, I'll look at this on the uh, big screen here because we're taking the link in the newsroom as we speak. And I look and go, the bloke actually put it out, stop behind Gil McLaughlin and go, What's going on here? <laughs> Sam, he's got no idea what's been announced. Well, oh, on well, another day, I, don't, yeah. I don't know how far-reaching, Seb, talk of the town is, particularly north of the border. But if someone could direct us to that gentleman, I would love to know what went up on the scorecard after. What did he have on the 16th? Because if it's anything, anything better than a quadruple bogey, I do not believe you, Seb. It you was the old dog's pre- date, boys. A dog's <laughs> date. A big number eight. <laughs> if you know the press conference putter, let us know. Mate. On another day, we might have said his ball sank quicker than the Adelaide Crows season. But the Crows have had a win, Treaders. First win against the Hawks last night. What has that news done in South Australia to raise morale? Well, it was funny, wasn't it? They're actually south saying that they've had more wins in September than Port Adelaide for quite some time. The fact <laughs> oh, that even though we yes. still are in the minor round, Adelaide Crows will grasp at anything. Don't worry about that. But I was actually really, on a serious note, I was really happy with their performance last night. They played relentless, ruthless footy for four quarters. First time this year they played four quarters. No coincidence they got the result. But it's fair to say, inside a playing group, take away your allegiances or who you play. If you're a play club who's trained for nine months or so of the year, even longer, gone through two pre-seasons, not won a game and you get the result, full credit to them because they have copped it from left, right and centre and for once, they sit there and go, job done. Sam, a bit of pressure off Matthew Nix to get that first win. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the monkey off the back, really, for Matty Nix. I don't think anyone deserved to go through a full season without winning a game. Um, cynically, Treaders, I was actually... I was brilliant for the, the Crows players and so good to get the, the jubilation that they required and deserved, by the way. I was more interested in the Hawks, you know, particularly on this side of the border. I mean, what does it do for their mentality? This is a team that, you know, won four premierships in the last 12 years. They've been unbeatable at times and they've still got some pretty good players, albeit they've got some injuries. But I just wonder what it does to the psyche of that group. Yeah, also, too, what it does for their senior coach, too, who is you know four-time superstar coach, will go down as a Hall of Fame, probably even a Hall of Fame legend at the end of his career many years from now. But Alistair Clarkson now faces the, the original journey that he first inherited at the end of 2004, start of 2005 season. He has to build a list again. And he, he's doing it off the back of probably more senior players. Gunston still proving a star. Shields a star. There's still a number of players. Bruce as well. But there's also some ageing veterans who are career is, is coming towards an end. Clearly, the Chad Wingard trade, they gave up a lot for it. They now have to go to the draft and go to the draft hard. What he said last night can sound like an excuse, and it's all convenient because Cawthorne now is battling. But he, he didn't shy away from it. And that's what I liked about Clark. He goes, no, if I had my time and if it wasn't such a year, I'd probably rip paint, rip the strips off players. But Realistically, right now, he, he is right. He is heading into a compromised draft. He can sit and whinge all he wants to the AFL, but reality is we've known about this for a long, long time. But the other agenda that I do agree well with what he talked about, and I've spoken to two list managers about this problem, is whilst the, the AFL lists the monitorium on contracts to sign players, I can tell you right now, AFL list managers have to sign players without knowing exactly what the salary cap is, whether they're going to have a rookie list or whether they're going to have their list cut in total off the main list. And still, when they sign them, they have to put in about four or five different clauses subject to if the salary cap drops, list managers drop, uh, the, the sizes drop. It, it's just dead set ridiculous that AFL needs to show some more leadership and I agree with Clarko on that bit but let's face it the Hawks are in a bad rot and they're going to have to go to the draft very hard for the next three years to get themselves out of it. Alistair Clarkson saying last night that when terms of information when it comes to the draft we need it badly and when we talk about a compromise draft some of the best players of course already assigned to clubs uh, through academy picks. You mentioned uh, Clarko's success Sam I'm going to ask a really really tough question I don't know what the answer is but uh, the old ACDC song Who Made Who? Hodge, Lewis, Franklin, Roughhead, Mitchell, 
or Alistair Clarkson? Who made who? Oh, I think it's hard to pick one without the other, but I would say the coach. I mean, Alistair Clarkson came in there in 04 when they were a laughing stock and, you know, 100 point defeats in their first couple of years. And he's turned those guys into champions. Would they have been champions without him? I guess we'll never know. But um, I personally think that Alistair Clarkson deserves all the plaudits that he gets for what he's been able to do. And the interesting thing now, I mean, Trent has used the example of Chad Wingard. How's Chad Wingard feeling now? You know, he had the option of going to the Western Bulldogs. But he probably picks Hawthorne for a couple of reasons. One, the Clarko effect, which I think every every player would probably think about. And the other one is Hawthorne have just showed treaders over the last 15 years, they don't bottom out. You know, they're going to remain competitive. I wonder how Tom Mitchell's feeling as well, probably in a different scenario. He's won a Brownlow medal and he's going to be a star no matter what. But, you know, these guys in the prime of their, their careers that are playing well, and Wingard's had a good year or for those Hawthorne fans that have watched him. Um, I just wonder what they're thinking because if Treaders is right and they have to bottom out to go back up, then, you know, players' careers suffer for that. And that's why I've, I've admired teams like Geelong and Hawthorne and, um, and Sydney for so many years is because no matter what, they remain competitive. They haven't done a Carlton or a Melbourne and tried to stay at the bottom of the ladder for five years and then use their high-end draft picks to go north, north. Because as we've seen with both those two clubs, it doesn't always prove successful. Hey, I have no mistake, up. boys. You've got to, you have to go to the draft. Whether you hit the bottom like Adelaide is or not, you still got to go to the draft. And, and I'll answer that question. I'm happy to say that. I think the players, if you look at it, if a coach could be the greatest coach in the world, but if you haven't got the cattle, you're not going to go anywhere. Whereas a coach who I think can be quite average or good or solid or, or, or just slightly above average and not the greatest of all time, if he's got the greatest players of all time and the greatest list of all time, then that's going to get you a mind. And I'm not saying coaches have no influence. They have unbelievable influence because do you think that Luke Hodges is affected by Clarker? Absolutely. Franklin, yes. Roughhead, yes. All these guys. The coaches are managers and they help keep the players at the top. At the end of the day, the player still has to perform. So yep. I think the player, the onus is on the player to perform more so than the coach. And the dynasties of all the great dynasties are built off the back of superstar players who come to play and a coach who manages them very well. Can I answer again? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you have just said that uh, Hodge, Franklin, etc. are all carried by Al Clarkson. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah you I'm quite literally quite, said I'm they're rudderless, that. immature young men <laughs> who had no direction until they met their coach. <laughs> no, no, I just, just, just wait for this thing to light up. That'll be good. <laughs> Hey, um, I like the way Nathan Buckley is playing Media Watch at the moment and being very direct uh, when he sees something he doesn't like. And one of them, Treaders, was an article written about him. It talked about uh, an emptiness that the author, I think it was Mark Robinson, uh, assumed that Bucks would have having never won a flag. How did you find Nathan's response? And also, mate, you've won a flag, but, but do players feel an emptiness if they have a career where one didn't come? Well, I think the first way to say is never assume what someone's feeling. And, and I think it's easy to say in media because we're all got an opportunity and, and that's an easy one for everyone to go, yeah, Nathan Buckley would feel unfulfilled. But I look at it where his life has gone. He looks like he's quite financial. He's been very successful. He's got the best out of himself. But if we're judging every person on whether you win an AFL premiership, then you would say that he is unfulfilled. But then you look on the other side of it and go, there's a number of people who've won um, AFL premierships or got to the, at the peak of their field and their life has fallen apart. So they would be fulfilled. So I think it is really inconsistent. I thought the way he answered that in his press conference the other night was absolutely sensational because there is a lot to like about Nathan Buckley. I never played with him. Uh, I have a, a, a little bit of a link with him through, we actually were both managed by um, Jeff Motley, the former Port Adelaide South Australian star for many years. So I know him through that. I got nothing but utmost respect for him. But if you hang your hat on premiership success, I think it comes back to the individual. If you hear a player who's played in four grand finals say, I'm unfulfilled because I didn't win it, well, that's fine. But just don't assume the player who is his teammate's unfulfilled because you know what? There's, there's nothing wrong with giving your all in life and coming up short you still gave your all. And I think that's important to recognise, as particular, whether it's football or not. Well said. Well, guys, I know you've been waiting for it and I don't want to hold back any longer. It is time for Seb's speedy segment, uh, or as I like to call it, triple-less. Now, we need to put 60 seconds on the clock and it'll be a series of quick-fire questions, of which I will start with you, Warren Treadray. 60 seconds starts now. After commemorating Kale Hooker's 200th game with footage of him conceding goals, do Fox Footy owe Hooker an apology? Yes. I agree. Hey, Sam, just quickly, do they? Yes. 
Do we want to see more of Nathan Buckley's media watch, Sam? Yes. He was as the one that got part of it. <laughs> Treaders, the Bombers are now two points out of the eight. They're probably going to win three games to make finals. Are their finals hopes sunk? No, I don't think they are. They've got that game in hand still. So, And I still think the eight is not settled. Far from. I think the top part is. The rest of it, no, there's plenty to play. Who's, who's that? Which club? Yeah, yes, the Bombers. Yeah. Oh, ridiculous Warren. Go, at, at that is just an... Stop the clock, Bruce. Hang on, stop the clock. Go, Sam. No, well, they can't make the eight. Yes, can. You see the ladder? Three wins and beat Melbourne. They're two points out of the eight. Don't they play Geelong? Yeah, well, you know. No. Minus details, Sam. Minor details. They All right, start the clock again. And I want they to just can finish. still make the they eight. They can't make the eight. Don't, don't, don't they listen to it. They can still. They can still. No. Start the clock again. And we're going to go home with a hurry. We're going to focus on grand final entertainment. There seems a feeling it'll be Queensland X. So, yes or no, in addition to Powder Finger Sam, should we have Savage Garden? Uh, no. <laughs> That's clearly a no. Uh, former uh, band. You look uh, like you're constipated. <laughs> <laughs> Polyester Girl Hitmakers Regurgitator Treaders. Should they get a Oh, absolutely. The grannies will love that one. <laughs> former Queensland resident Barry Gibb, leader of the BT set. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> not going all right. Uh, I was going to suggest the former Eurovision contestant and who are just a little bit hit maker Gina G. But I might finish there. That would be that good. Is, yeah, a bit of Gina G. Yeah. Is Sam still constipated? I'm still trying to picture why some of those people were mentioned. Hang on. Because they're from think. Queensland, yeah. mate. <laughs> I understand that, Warren. It doesn't mean they need to actually be at the grand final. Okay, let's get Pat Rafter to sing the national anthem then. <laughs> now, that, now, that's a good idea. Or Pat Cash, potentially, with his headband. Oh, Isn't he a Victorian? Pat wouldn't be allowed into, exactly. Wouldn't be allowed into He's a Victorian. <laughs> I missed the point. I don't know how someone who posts so many photos on social media of them drinking coffee could possibly be constipated. But anyway, that brings us uh, to the... Uh, that's you, Sam. That brings us to the social club for this week. And you've actually uh, nominated uh, the social club entrant this week. Can you give us a little bit of a spiel here? It's a young girl uh, somewhere in Asia who... Yes, that's right. It was a, it's a kite festival you'll see here, yes. Deb. Now, we won't laugh at this part because uh, obviously very scary. It's only a four-year-old girl. She gets She's so tied to a kite, big gust of wind comes. She gets lifted oh. 10 metres into the air. Very, very scary for her. Uh-huh. And the crowd all tr- trying to make sure they're underneath her to catch her if, if and when she comes down. Now, uh-huh. thankfully, she came down and yep. she came down at quite a nice speed. So she was able to be caught, but it took two or three really quick-minded and safe-hands individuals right. to Ooh. make sure that they were there. And it got me Ooh, thinking, yes. I'm always yes. thinking talk of the town, mm. who of the three of us would you least like to be <laughs> catching your child if they were coming oh. down, right? And she's okay, so we can laugh about it. She's fine. She had minor scratches, didn't even go to hospital. But I just, a couple of people sent me images, and here we go. Yep. There's one of Warren... Dropping one that was probably oh, an easy chest mark. Oh, oh now like this is going uh, down. And nuts, another one, uh, Luke McFarlane. There is probably just get the hands out. I would have thought treaders, and then there's uh, another one that you can see here. It's an easy sort of mark that he probably should have taken uh, in front of Charles Smith. Better. So uh, I, I, I just think, Sam, you and I probably should have got <laughs> the nod to be the ones just to stand yeah. underneath, and treaders yeah. maybe hold the camera. Well, look, I've uh, done a lot of hard labour in my life, so my hands are quite uh, now cut up and rough, so there'd be yes. a bit of traction there to catch the baby. Uh, Trent, is your response? Oh, my God. I'm actually having to respond against two <laughs> blokes with dad bods who <laughs> haven't done any exercise in their life, <laughs> let alone caught anything, <laughs> and jump at the site and, and fall asleep at night only with the light on. So uh, it's fine. I'll take it. Treaders, you, you pick any. Treaders, you pick any any exercise you want, and I'll beat you at it right now. Oh, hello. What about so, Fletch? Over the next week, go on. If, <laughs> why don't you go do a three k time trial? Just make no, just no, no. You know what? Why don't we do it? Why don't, why don't we actually film ourselves doing a ten k run like you do every time on Instagram? <laughs> 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 Who cares, mate? <laughs> Who cares that you ran around just get the net, boys. meters? <laughs> Just get house. the net. We got one. Uh, 
Uh, this has gone in a different what, direction. What is our latest <laughs> instalment this year? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm a journalist I'm, dot host. That's questionable. Mm. Um, <laughs> happy birthday, mate. Thanks. That was actually for a little while ago. Thanks. Did you get burnt from that? Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Complexion jokes. Nah, I won't take that. That's, no, uh, he that's can not... do it. He can do it. Look. Yeah. No, nah, that's not. I'm actually, no, nah, I'm, nah, <laughs> I'm not taking it. If you the birthday cake and, and then show the next photo, it appears like some of the hair was burnt off by the candles. <laughs> All right. Sure things. All the week. Sure. That uh, needs a shave. That's a sure thing. <laughs> sure. I actually got a lot of positive feedback for that, Mo. Yeah. I actually, oh yeah, I had to, yeah. I don't doubt it. Good. I'm going first. Uh, no. Which one beat Fremantle? Oh. <laughs> Ready? Yep. Oh, oh okay. God. Who are Carlton oh, playing this week? Giants. I'll pick the Giants. Done. That's not good. That leaves me either Melbourne over... I'll take Melbourne over Sydney. Because I don't know who's winning out of uh, Collingwood and uh, the Lions. Probably Brisbane. Melbourne over Sydney. Well, we have covered a hell of a lot of ground as part of this week's Talk of the Town. The Port Adelaide Premiership champion, Warren Treadray. See you, boys. And the Chief Football Reporter for the Nine Network, Sam McClure. I'm, I'm penning a complaint against Warren. I thought that the, the, the burnt suggestion from the candles was unnecessary. <laughs> This has been Talk of the Town. See you next week.